All right, as was mentioned, my name is Matthew Reimbold. I'm gonna be talking about overcoming complexity through the principle of least power. Who's ready for some controversy? All right. Um, complexity, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And we should all start with defining what complexity is before we get too far into the weeds, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Wonderful book came out last year um, by John Osterhout that described complexity as anything related to the structure of a software system that makes it hard to understand and modify that system. Probably all of us are currently trying to figure out how to do business agility, greater, faster, better, more, probably in the midst of some kind of digital transformation effort. And the degree to which we can achieve those kind of things is really based on the amount of complexity that we have in our systems. And everybody here has probably seen the complexity inherent in the modern software stack, but the fact is every company is now dealing with this kind of complexity whether they want to or not. Back in 2011, Mark Andreessen famously said that software was eating the world. And then a little bit later, Forbes said, well, okay, every company is now a software company. And then about 2015, we went and we said, oh, well, by the way, now APIs are eating all that software. It's an incredibly complex layering. As the director for the Capital One Center of Excellence, I lead the team that sets the API and event streaming standards for approximately 9,000 geographically dispersed developers. A vast majority of those developers contribute thousands of APIs to our internal developer portal. And then those APIs drive approximately 3.5 billion requests every day. That's a complex ecosystem that we are responsible for managing. In addition to that day job, I also happen to write a newsletter called Net API Notes. And in that newsletter, I chronicle the journey that I see a lot of companies taking. And regardless of where we're at in that journey, all companies eventually come up against complexity. It's something we're all dealing with. So why are APIs so critical? Why do these things keep coming up when we talk about complexity in systems and software? Uh, it's because the API is the greatest leverage point in a system. This is another great book. Uh, it's a little bit older. Don't let that scare anybody. It's not hacker news, but it is still worthwhile reading. Um, they point out that the greatest leverage in a system is architecting at the interfaces. APIs are the means by which we can start grappling with some of this complexity. They allow us to create abstractions. These abstractions allow programmers to work on a system without being exposed to all the system's complexity at once. An API is a simplified view, and it omits unimportant details. It makes it easier to think about and manipulate complex things. It's why APIs have exploded both internally and externally to many companies. In our organization, we may have started with very simple building block APIs, and then maybe we had APIs that we extended to partners. And then over time, those APIs found new ways of dealing with complexity. Perhaps you've heard of the back end for front end pattern. Perhaps you've heard of experience layers. These were all ways of dealing with the complexity of how these APIs were multiplying and how the different market concerns or experiences that we had to deliver necessitated new architectural constructs. Furthermore, about that same time that these other patterns were coming about, Martin Fowler and James Lewis were talking about microservices. And those things perpetuated and they grew bigger and bigger until we ended up with these. Oh my gosh. So while the complexity that an individual team had to deal with was small and constrained and abstract, if you were at all in a position within a company to think about the totality of your ecosystem, things got really complex. And it's not just the deployment of the APIs themselves. It became a situation where, okay, now we have to talk about deployment pipelines and service meshes and monitoring tools and auditing and dependency management, all of which introduced their own emergent behavior. In fact, in the past several years while writing Net API notes, I've actually seen where companies have gone up to the point of going to microservices, 
and then they retreat back into the monolith because the complexity that they had known was more comfortable than the com new complexity that they were about to deal with. What's interesting is as we get these layers, they begin to change at different rates, and we can start thinking about them in terms of a stack. Stuart Brand also recognized the, the commonality among things changing at different rates. And he put it together into a theory called pace layering. The idea was is that as a culture, we tend to stratify into different rates at which things change. In the clock of the long now, he described pace layering as, as a stack in which the layers at the top build upon the slower moving layers below it. At the bottom, we have nature. The laws of physics are not likely to change, nor would we want them to. That would be very disruptive. They're, for all intents and purposes, pretty constant. Above nature, we have culture. People are people. The reason that the stories of the Greeks and the Romans still resonate with us today is because we see ourselves in those stories. Very slow moving. Above that, we have governance. Now note, I'm not saying governments, which can change at a, at a reasonable pace, but governance, methods of governance, things like democracies or populism. Those move a bit faster than culture. Next, we have infrastructure, our roads, the plumbing systems, the electrical systems. Those do change. If you do go to the East Coast or even overseas in Europe, you go into older buildings that you can see where they had to layer in new infrastructure over the existing walls. That stuff does change at a slightly faster pace than governance. Then we have commerce, the ability for business to provide new services, products, experiences in response to demand. That changes at a fairly fast clip, and then at the very top of the pace layer, we have fashion. This is the speed at which new ideas, new things occur. It's how fast your department store window swaps out new ideas. It changes very, very rapidly. One layer is not more important than another, and it turns out that all layers are important for a well-functioning system. Each system has its place. Imagine if something as important as, oh, I don't know, domestic and foreign policy changed on a whim. Just imagine. That would not be a good thing. Likewise, if you're trying to innovate at the speed of bureaucratic consensus, that's also probably not ideal. All layers are necessary. As Stuart says in his book, the fast layers learn, the slow remembers. The fast proposes, the slow disposes. Fast is continuous and slow, or, so, excuse me, fast is discontinuous and slow is continuous. Fast and slow informs the slow and big by accrued innovation and occasional revolution, and the slow and the big control the fast by constraint and constancy. Fast gets all our attention. We love fashion. It's what drives ticket sales to conferences like this. It's what sells books. It's what gets those enterprise licenses. However, it's really the slow that has all the power. So when it comes to the web, or net APIs, I see a similar stack. And I'm gonna insert my standard default warning here about models. As many of you that have dealt with models probably know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So the purpose of this model is to illustrate and articulate some concepts. It's not meant to be comprehensive, and it's not meant to be exhaustively, academically proven sound. Again, it's to illustrate ideas. So walk with me on this thought experiment. At the bottom, again, we have those things of nature. The speed of light between two points in a distributed system is probably not going to change. Fair enough? Next up, we have the TCP IP layer. The protocol has been around since the 70s. We're coming up on 50 years. And that's a good thing, because something as necessary as packet uh, transfer between different areas needs to be pretty stable. 
it's baked in to things like frameworks and languages and even hardware routing layers. Probably not going anywhere, anywhere, anywhere soon, <laughs> despite the fact that HTTP is com HTTP 3 is coming and is probably going to be doing some stuff around UDP. Interesting stuff there, but we're not there yet. On top of TCP, we have HTTP, and there's lots of different protocols around this area, things like email and FTP. However, uh, we start here with HTTP 1.1, which a guy named Roy Fielding happened to work on, and that was ratified in 1999. And while many haven't implemented it yet, we do have HTTP 2, which came out in 2015. So granted, that seems slow, especially at the rates of fashion, but compared to something like TCP, which is nearing 50 years old, that's, that's, that's moving, that's hopping. And here's where I purposely made it interesting. HTTP itself could be thought of as various layers. There's the verbs or the methods, and everybody here is probably familiar with get, put, patch, and post. No, uh, no arguing there. You might even get saucy and maybe do patch. Um, there's others like options and head, and those are useful in some situations. There's a couple more, but really, for all intents and purposes, we're maybe talking about 10 different things that you have to keep in your cognitive space when you're talking about verbs. The next up are status codes. And you can go out on the web and you can look around and, and sources will vary, but ultimately, you could be talking about 50 to 60 of these things, and if you really step back and think about it, we're really only focused on three main types. There's the 2XX that tell you you did something right as a client. There's the 4XX that tell you you probably should make a change before you make another request. And then there's the 5XX that's going to tell you that the server is having a bad moment and uh, please hold off. Fairly straightforward. Some nuance in there, but still grokkable. You can keep that in your head. And then the last layer that I want to point out on the HTTP protocol are the headers. And there's hundreds of these. Uh, most of them go into a, a, a layer of nuance and depth that probably isn't warranted, isn't interesting to most folks. But there are some pieces in there that can make a huge difference in traffic flow on a network. It's an ability to shape results. The fastest request is the one you never have to make. And the API can provide some thoughtful clues through caching headers to a client. It's a beautiful, highly performant thing. Headers are also where we can perform things like content negotiation, allowing us to do not only JSON, but things like PDFs and CSVs and all kinds of wonderful binary protocols over this layer. Going above that, then we have the Internet Engineering Task Force, R. FCs, and there's thousands and thousands of these. And again, they go into a level of detail and nuance that most of us probably don't care about. However, this is also exciting. This is, we're getting now more into the experimentation, and this is where developers and communities are codifying very interesting things that they think might be useful to others. They're arguing about it. They're um, putting it out there and getting feedback and evolving these things so that you do end up with some very compelling pieces that can aid in the API that you're building. Some of those include the RFC 7807, and that's to define a common error object. Unfortunately, all of our APIs at some point have to deal with errors, and dealing with it in a structured way, in a way that uh, has been thoughtfully put together and includes details that one might not otherwise hit upon themselves is very important. And then there's also RFC 8594, which is the sunset header. These APIs don't live forever. They do get versioned, they do get recent, um, shut down at some point, and it's important to provide a formalized mechanism, a standard way of communicating this stuff out. In the case of the sunset header, it was very exciting to see this shared and, and grow in a community fashion. It started on Twitter with a few folks saying, hey, I have this problem, and other folks chiming in saying, hey, I have that problem too. And then building that into something that ultimately 
has now got this acronym assigned to it. Finally, at the top of this layering are patterns. There are some patterns like the back end for front end uh, or the experience API pattern that become popular, so popular in fact that they might drive changes further down in the stack, getting an RFC that eventually changes the HTTP protocol, so on and so forth. But then there's other stuff. Remote procedure call is a pattern. Webhooks are a pattern. Hypermedia is also a pattern. There can be many, 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 many of these types of patterns, and they're all bumping up against each other. Some become more popular, some fade away, and that's a good thing. It's also a situation where somebody could post a new post to Hacker News or the Netflix engineering blog, and boom, suddenly there's a new pattern that people are, are scrambling to adopt. That's really good. The wonderful thing is how these layers perform and how they gracefully degrade. Suppose, for example, that I provi provide an API that implements one of those RFCs, like that pre-mentioned 7807. That's the standard error object. I, as an API provider, could provide that, and if the client doesn't care, all they'll see is a standard um, structure of JSON that they would be parsing anyway. That's the graceful degradation that I'm talking about. It's not an all or nothing thing. That client doesn't have to implement that particular RFC. However, if I have one of those complex ecosystems like shown on the uh, microservice Death Stars and everybody within a company has agreed to use that RFC, now I can do some interesting things. Now I can build tooling at my gateway layer to do notifications when I start seeing these standard objects going out. I can start doing counts, I can start doing alerts, I can start tying it to teams and performances and put together very interesting statistical logs because all of that error information has been standardized. That's very powerful. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper and talk about um, uh, the uh, e-tags. Again, I may provide, as an API provider, I may provide some semblance of caching information to the client. Again, the request that's not made is ultimately the fastest. Now, if that client is set up to use it, that's fantastic. We have a very fast communication pattern. However, if that client isn't looking for that or doesn't care, again, graceful degradation. They still get their response. Perhaps it's not as efficient as it possibly could be, but it still works. All right, you've been waiting for the controversial part. Let's talk about GraphQL. Who is a GraphQL developer? Do you have any rotten food that you might throw? Actually, hopefully this, this isn't as controversial as I could make it. I think this, the importance of pointing this out is to illustrate the difference between the things, not to say that one is good or bad, they're just different. They approach things in a different way. I put GraphQL as a pattern because it very, is, it very much is a different way of accessing information and updating information. And it really bypasses all of these intermediate HTTP layers. So for example, uh, we don't really care about RFCs. We're not gonna implement those. There's no headers to be found. Uh, that we are only going to use a 200 response every single time, even when the request is erroneous. And we're only going to use HTTP post. In essence, we've defined all of these things, and we're only going to do these things, bypassing those layers so that we can tunnel over TCP. Okay, fair enough. I can hear some of the thought processes right now. Well, Matthew, GraphQL, doesn't that represent an abstraction of complexity rather than having to think about which verb do I use now, which status code do I use now, uh, what header? Like, isn't this an abstraction that frees the developer from having to think about that complexity? Well, we have to re remember that complexity is neither created nor destroyed. It only moves around and changes shape. So in this particular situation, yes, I don't have to think about which verb and which status code and which header to use. However, 
If I want to have caching, oh, now I'm implementing that myself. If I have to use, um, if I want to define standard error objects, now I'm coming up with something myself. Or perhaps I'm following a vendor's guidelines, like Apollo, but I'm having to recreate this. And that's complexity for me as the GraphQL provider. It's also complexity for consumers who are now having to deal with these different implementations of something that otherwise would have been standardized in an abstraction of that complexity. GraphQL is not a layered approach. And anything from the pattern to the TCP layer is either strictly defined by GraphQL or it's left for developers to recreate on their own. It gives the GraphQL developer tremendous power to solve problems. When I started my development career, I started in assembly and I was moving bits from register to register. And when I upgraded to C, now I was doing my own memory management. That was incredibly powerful. It gave me a tremendous amount of control, but it also meant that I was spending a fair amount of time doing things that otherwise would have been abstracted in higher level languages. The principle of least power by some guy named Tim Berners-Lee talks about choosing the least powerful computer language for a given purpose. Similarly, we have this for this API stack. Don't we want more power to solve problems? Don't we want to have the best tools and the most flexible interfaces at our, our, our uh, fingertips? Who in their right mind would be a fan of least power? Well, let me put it like this. We can apply this to our layers. When I call an API, I can include some kind of bespoke instructions in my payload to say which thing I should do now. Or I could use a get. Or I could use a patch that doesn't require introspection of the body. That sounds trivial when you're one developer. But when you're talking about an ecosystem of things, thousands upon thousands of things that need to be governed on an API level, that we're trying to provide tooling and support and frameworks for, that becomes a very, very big deal. Where the complexity is put in those systems when it comes to tracing, monitoring, entitling, securing, rate limiting, frame working, and supporting. So do I hate GraphQL? Am I advocating that we only use boring technology, that the old stuff is better? No. No, this is not my old man moment here on stage. Um, I, while I am a fan of the Boring Technology Club, you can go to HTTP boringtechnology.club. It's a, it's a fun read. And it has some interesting ideas there. That's not the message I want you to take away from this presentation. I've grown to really appreciate what happens with the fashionable layers. The chaotic experimentation is exciting. The vigor for overturning assumptions and pursuing new avenues is how we discover new, potentially powerful ideas. In a healthy stack, the best ideas go from being fashionable to products sold via commerce to essential pieces for infrastructure and eventually require governance as they become important pieces of business culture. What I do advocate for in my last minute here is making conscious decisions when pursuing these new patterns and this new experimentation. Eschewing layers comes with trade-offs, and we should enter into these decisions with eyes wide open. As Fred Brooks said, the author of The Mythical Man Month, he said, there are no silver bullets, and we need to approach our architectural decisions that same way. In conclusion, every company is a software company. Every company is wrestling with growing complexity one approach to dealing with complexity is to create abstractions and the abstractions at different layers in any system evolve at different rates. Net, a net APIs have evolved into different layers and each layer means that if you apply the principle of least power, you will arrive at simpler abstractions that will help you deal with complexity. And overcoming complexity requires pragmatic decisions um, that we make while being aware of the trade-offs.
So I'll have these slides along with some additional color and links to the sources at my website. It's just my name.com. Uh, I'll announce when that's ready on my Twitter stream and in my newsletter, NetAPI Notes. I am Twitter's LibelVox. That's my newsletter. Thank you for the precious commodity of your time, and please enjoy the rest of the conference.